This weekend brings the 92nd Annual Academy Awards, and while I'm not a huge fan of awards show, I have to admit that I genuinely love the Oscars. Sure, they make a lot of boneheaded decisions, and the hosts are sometimes disappointing, but I grew up watching them, and I still look forward to seeing what happens. Now, one thing I've always wanted to do was vote at the Oscars, but seeing as I've never made a movie or worked in Hollywood or been nominated for any awards, it seems that my chances are pretty slim. With that dream squashed, I figured I would do the next best thing. Vote for the Game Pro Reader's Choice Awards. Okay, so maybe that's not the next best thing, but it's exactly what we're going to be doing today. I've pulled out this ballot from the November 1992 issue of Game Pro Magazine that wanted me to vote for the best games of the year. I didn't do it back in the day, but hey, it's better late than never, right? Join me as I go through all 11 categories and pick the absolute best games of 1992. Alright, with all that out of the way, I figure let's just jump right into this. I have my ballot in hand, and I uh, have no idea how long this is going to take, so let's just... Let's just go. I mean, I, I'm doing this on an empty stomach, and the sooner we get this ballot filled out, the sooner I can eat. But before we start, I first want to mention that I think what we're going to do is uh, we're going to go through each of these uh, categories individually. I'm just going to read out all of the nominations, and then we'll probably narrow it down a little bit here and there. I'll tell you my thoughts on some of the games individually, and then I'll vote. It's pretty simple, and hopefully you'll play along at home. Not that it's a quiz or a competition, it's really just your opinion, and I guarantee nobody at GamePro cares what I fill out or what you say about any of these games all these decades later. This whole exercise is a complete waste of time, but I swear this is still going to be entertaining. Or it could be a train wreck. It doesn't matter because we're just going to jump into it with our first of 11 categories, the best action adventure game. Now, I should mention, of course, that all of these different categories has a bit at the end where we could fill in our own winner, just in case we disagree with the nominations. To make things easier, I've decided to just ignore that. We're just going to accept that GamePro got it right, these are the best of the best, and we're going to pick one of those games. So, when it comes to the nominations for Best Action Adventure Game, we have Alien 3 on the Genesis, Contra 3, the Alien Wars on the Super NES, Hook on the Super NES, Mick and Max Global Gladiator on the Genesis, Out of This World on the Super Nintendo or Genesis, Roadrunner's Death Valley Rally on the Super Nintendo, Sonic the Hedgehog 2 on the Genesis, Spider-Man and the X-Men Arcade's Revenge on the Super Nintendo, Super Double Dragon on the Super NES, Super Star Wars on the Super Nintendo, and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 4, Turtles in Time, of course, on the Super Nintendo. Alright, this is a pretty good list of games. There's some stuff I might have included, but you know what? I, like I said, we're just going to accept these 11 nominations as just gospel. Right off the bat, though, I gotta get rid of Spider-Man and X-Men Arcade's Revenge. It's, I mean, look, it's it's fine. It's it's an okay brawler, but it is not. It's 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 not up there with with the rest of these. The same same with Hook. What what's Hook doing there? It's a just a bad bad movie game. I uh, I like uh, I liked Super Star Wars. I liked. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, of course. Uh, Super Double Dragon is fine, I guess. A few of the standouts, though, that, that don't get enough recognition these days, I have to say, is, of course, I love Mick and Max Global Gladiators. I know, I know, it's basically just a big McDonald's uh, advertisement, but it's, it's so good. I think a lot of people back then would have voted, and I, I think this was even the winner, uh, would have voted for uh, Sonic the Hedgehog 2. It was it was really, really great, but as I look over this list, and I think about the category, oh boy, Out of This World is really good. I, it, I'm not sure how well it holds up, and it was kind of a revelation at the time, but if we're just talking pure action, I gotta say that my favorite of these games is probably... Contra 3 The Alien Wars on the Super Nintendo. 
There's a whole category for shoot 'em up that we're gonna get to in a minute, and I probably woulda stuck Contra 3 there. But hey, it's like the Golden Globes and how they nominated The Martian as best comedy. I figure that if they're gonna put it on this action adventure list, then I'm just gonna have to vote for it. So Contra 3 is my decision. Now let's move on to a category I know almost nothing about, which is best sports game. The 1990s was a huge time for sports, especially because we were starting to get a lot of licensed sports games. All of these companies were starting to get really good at making these simulators, and you know what? I couldn't care less. But I'm not gonna hold that against the genre, and maybe, maybe we will be able to find something that I like here, because here are the nominations. John Madden Football 92 on the Genesis. Lakers vs. Bulls and the NBA Playoffs on the Genesis, Muhammad Ali Boxing on the Genesis, NCAA Basketball on the Super Nintendo, NHL PA Hockey 93 on the Genesis, RBI Baseball 4 on the Genesis, Super Tennis on the Super Nintendo, Team USA Basketball on the Genesis, Top Gear on the Super Nintendo, and finally, True Golf Classics Pebble Beach Lynx. So, like I said, I'm not a big sports fan, just in general. I don't watch a lot of sports, I don't play a lot of sports games. That's actually one of the things that you'll notice about most of the reviews that I do, is there are very, very few sports games. It's not that I dislike them, but rather that I'm probably not the person to be talking about the rich history of sports, because I just, I haven't played a lot of these games, to be totally honest with you. But I will tell you one thing, which is I actually have uh, a little bit of history with at least one of these games, and that's, uh, believe it or not, Muhammad Ali Boxing. Now, to be fair, I haven't actually played that game, so don't get the wrong impression, but I went to the 1992 Consumer Electronics Show a long, long time ago. I know I'm old, and one of the people, one of the celebrities that I saw there signing autographs was, in fact, Muhammad Ali himself. I didn't stand in line, I didn't get an autograph, I just walked past and I saw him and I knew that's, that's, that's good enough. But as much as I remember seeing Muhammad Ali live, there's, there's no way that I can give this award to him, I've never played his game. I have played Madden Football 92, I've played the NHL uh, hockey game, I've played it, actually I've played a few of these Pebble Beach uh, links. Super Tennis I played, look, I've played, I've played about half of these games, but, oh, jeez. If I was going to go back and play any of these, oh, I don't know if it's going to be any of, like, the basketball or baseball or, I don't think so. I think the one I would actually want to go back to, and I think this is why I'm going to vote for it, is uh, Top Gear on the Super Nintendo. I think it's a pretty solid racing game, and it was one of the few that allowed you to play uh, two players at the same time. And I'm mostly just reminded of it recently because just a year or two ago I reviewed uh, Horizon Chase Turbo on the uh, on the PlayStation 4. It's on a bunch of other systems, though. And when I played that, I went back and I played some of Top Gear, and I loved it. It is such, such a good game. So my vote goes to Top Gear on the Super Nintendo. Moving on, we have the best role-playing game. Now, this is a little bit more my speed. I played a ton of role-playing games, but there are a few on here that I have not played, so we'll we'll see what's going on here. All right, let's start. Uh, the very first nomination is Axe Battler on the Game Gear, followed by Buck Rogers Countdown to Doomsday on the Genesis, Cosmic Fantasy II on the TurboGrafx CD, Dungeons and Dragons, Warrior of the Eternal Sun on the Genesis, Dragon Warrior 4 on the Nintendo Entertainment System, King's Quest 5 on the NES, Loom on the Turbo Duo, Soul Blazer on the Super Nintendo, The Legend of Zelda, A Link to the Past, also on the Super Nintendo, and of course, Wanderers from East 3 on the Super Nintendo. All right, uh, oh boy, um... I'm not sure I consider The Legend of Zelda to be a role-playing game. I would have put that over with the action-adventure game, but, uh, I mean, it's it's on this list. Axe Battler is the, uh, it, that's the, the Golden Axe adventure role-playing thing on the Game Gear. I'm not a, not a huge fan of that. Loom is kind of a point-and-click adventure game, and I think that that probably deserves to be in a different category. I mean, 
I know it's not an action-adventure game, but it is more of an adventure than it is a role-playing game, but I'm just quibbling at this point. In fact, they're, like I didn't even remember that Buck Rogers' Countdown to Doomsday was even a role-playing game. I guess I kind of always thought that was an action game. Should go back and check that out. When it comes down to it, though, ah, uh, boy. Yeah, like, there are some... There's some weird games here. Like, I I don't think King's Quest V should be here. Cosmic Fantasy II is is a solid game, but I remember it for other reasons, not not for necessarily being, like, that must-own role-playing game. I like the East series quite a bit, but Wanderers from East just was not a, not a great game. The side-scrolling stuff didn't really work for me, and it was a big step down after East Book 1 and 2. They also did a better job of remaking it years later, so I'm not even sure I would ever go back and play that version of East 3, to be honest. Uh, this is such a weird list. I, oh boy, I, I like Soul Blazer. I'm not sure I've played Dragon Warrior 4 in a long time. D&D &D game. I mean, I guess because even though I disagree that it's a role-playing game, I have to say that... The, the Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past is the best game of these games. It's the best one. I can't vote for anything else. So, Zelda 3, moving on. Okay, so we're finally to a category that I absolutely love. And of course, it's the best shoot 'em up. There's some there's some good games here. So let's just, just go through each of them individually here. Let's start with Airzonk on the TurboGrafx 16. Axley on the Super Nintendo. Gate of Thunder on the Turbo Duo. Soul Dees on the Genesis. That's not to be confused with Soul Feast on the Sega CD, which did not get nominated. Soldier Blade on the TurboGrafx-16. Super Smash TV on the Super Nintendo. And Troubleshooter on the Genesis. All right, so... Oh, boy. If we're going to eliminate anything, I have to almost immediately eliminate Soul Dees. It's not that it's a bad game. We did a whole episode about it on one of the Game Over episodes not that long ago. I think it was last year sometime. And, you know, it's fine. It has a solid ending. But is it as good as Arizonk or Axley or Gate of Thunder or any of these others? Absolutely not. Same with Troubleshooter. What's that doing there? I think back then I probably would have said Super Smash TV because I loved Smash TV in the arcades. I think the problem, though, is that since then I've played so many dual stick shooters and the Super NES version, which is admittedly a pretty solid port, it's not the same, it's not as good as the original arcade version. Let's just put it that way. I think a lot of people would probably go with Axley on the Super Nintendo because, I mean, that looked so impressive at the time. The fire stage that everybody saw in the magazines was so cool looking. But, you know, I don't think it holds up. I don't, I, I went back to it recently and it's, it's just not as good as I remember it being. So much of what made that cool was how impressive the graphics are and... They're not as impressive these days, which obviously makes a lot of sense. These games are almost 30 years old. Oh, I think what I have to do is I have to say I have to give a shout out. This is not going to be the winner, but I have to give a shout out to Airzonk because uh, not enough people remember it. Not enough people played it. I think that more people need to go through because it it's really, really cool. It's colorful, has a lot of cool variety. And frankly, I like it a lot more than I like the Bonk series. But I know that's that's just me. I know. I think this is going to be an easy one for me, though. I, me back in the 90s would have said Super Smash TV. But me today, the one that I've gone through over and over since then has been Gate of Thunder. Gate of Thunder is is too good to not win this award. So that's my choice for best shoot 'em up. All right. So let's move on to our fifth category, which is puzzle and strategy game. Best puzzle strategy game. The nominations are Clue on the Super Nintendo and Genesis, Faceball 2000 on the Super Nintendo. What the hell is that doing there? Well, we'll talk about that in a second. Krusty's Super Fun House on the Super Nintendo, NES, and Genesis, Lemmings on the Super Nintendo, Genesis, and NES, Monopoly on the Super Nintendo and Genesis, 
on the ball on the Super Nintendo. Snow Brothers Jr. on the Game Boy. I, <laughs> I think that's the first appearance of the Game Boy on this ballot. Spin Dizzy Worlds on the Super Nintendo. Ward Triss on the Super Nintendo. And Yoshi on both the NES and the Game Boy. Okay, so let's discuss the elephant in the room here. So, Faceball 2000, if you have never played Faceball 2000, is a first-person shooter. It's an old, outdated, and incredibly archaic first-person shooter, but it is indeed a first-person shooter. And I think it's actually kind of funny because it shows how far we've come over the last three decades. They clearly had no idea where to put this thing. I mean, I, I get why they didn't want to put it in the shoot 'em up genre because it's not like Arizong or Gate of Thunder or things like that, but it probably deserves to be there more than it deserves to be as a puzzle strategy game. I guess it's kind of a strategy game in the sense that you have to strategize how to shoot the other people, but then are we going to call Fortnite or Call of Duty a strategy game? No, I, 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 I do not accept that. Getting rid of it, we're dropping that from the list. Other things I think we can get rid of, oh boy, I hate to say it, but Wordtress, because it's awful. The versions of Clue and Monopoly, those probably could go too. I, oh boy, this, this, I don't, hmm, I don't know what I'm gonna, ugh. Krusty Super Fun House is fine. Snow Brothers Jr. on the Game Boy is fine. Spin Dizzy Worlds is weird. I didn't like Yoshi that much. Of these games, oh. It's not even the best version of it, but the only one that really left an impact with me was, I guess, Lemmings. Both the, the Super Nintendo and Genesis. The, the Nintendo Entertainment System version was a little hard to play, but Lemmings in general is... That's the one of these that I would want to go back and play. So, for best strategy, best, sorry, best puzzle and strategy game, I'm going, oh boy, yeah, I'm going with Lemmings. Yeah. Now, here's the category where I think things are going to get contentious. This is the best head-to-head -head fighting game. You have to remember, this is just about a year after Street Fighter II hit the arcade and changed everything. As a result, we saw a bunch of different companies try to come up with their own competitor to Street Fighter 2, and you're going to see a lot of those listed here, and some of them are actually pretty memorable, but are they going to be able to beat Street Fighter 2? Let's find out. The nominations are Art of Fighting on the Neo Geo, Battle Blaze on the Super Nintendo, Fatal Fury on the Neo Geo, Street Fighter 2 on the Super Nintendo, and World Heroes on the Neo Geo. Yeah, 1992 was pretty much the year that SNK decided to turn the Neo Geo into a straight fighting game console. Or arcade cabinet. Well, you know what? Both. I like some of these games. We've actually talked about a bunch of these in the Game Over episodes. I think World Heroes is a pretty solid one-on-one -on -one fighting game. I wasn't a huge fan of the original Fatal Fury. It's kind of clunky. It's a little hard to control. It doesn't feel as good as Street Fighter and all of the like those kind of clones. Art of Fighting is a weird beast because, like, on one hand, it feel like you look at it and it seems like it wants to be a one-on-one -on -one fighting game like Street Fighter 2, but it it has a whole story mode. You can only really, I think it's what two people you control. I like elements from it, and we've also covered it on the Game Over episode, but no, I, I can't I can't have that as the winner. I have very little memory of Battle Blaze. I remember not liking it that much, but maybe I should give it another chance. I, I don't know. Look, this is going to be easy. Art of Fighting and World Heroes and all these are fine, but none of them are as good as Street Fighter 2 on the Super Nintendo. Not that not that Street Fighter 2 was necessarily a perfect port, but it was as close as you could possibly get at that time. I mean, this was just a year after the Super Nintendo came out, so this was still pretty early. I have to give them a lot of credit. So I'd be shocked if people disagreed with me here, but Street Fighter 2 on the Super Nintendo easily wins best head-to-head -head fighting. Okay, we're finally out of the genre awards, and now we're going to move on to the best graphic achievement. We're going to get to some technical stuff. 
The nominees for Best Graphical Achievement are Art of Fighting on the Neo Geo, It Came From the Desert on the TurboGrafx CD, NCAA Basketball on the Super Nintendo, Out of This World on the Super Nintendo and Genesis, Roadrunner's Death Valley Rally on the Super Nintendo, Prince of Persia on the Super Nintendo, Sonic the Hedgehog 2 on the Genesis, Street Fighter 2 on the Super Nintendo, Super Star Wars on the Super Nintendo, Tasmania on the Genesis, and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 4 Turtles in Time on the Super Nintendo. Alright, there's some, some repeats here. We've seen a few of these before, and I don't necessarily disagree with any of these. I think we could probably make a solid argument for all of them. For example, uh, Art of Fighting, I already said my piece about what I think of the game, but it does this thing where it, it zooms in and out depending on how close you are, and that was pretty revolutionary at the time. Street Fighter 2 wasn't doing that. It came from the desert, of course, that had a bunch of full motion video, and, and people were still impressed by that in 1992. It, it would be a, another year or so before it kind of got run into the ground and looked pretty bad, but right now, people were still pretty into full motion video. That was going to be the future. Roadrunner's Death Valley Rally and Tasmania are there because they actually kind of looked like the cartoons, at least way more than those old 8-bit versions of cartoon games. Even though it hasn't aged as well, I think the Super Nintendo version of Tasmania with the 3D graphics, that's probably more impressive. But I'm guessing that if I looked that up, that probably came out in 1993. Now, Out of This World and Prince of Persia are there for the rotoscope animation thing, which I, I gotta admit is pretty damn impressive. It was then. It still is to a certain extent. We've seen that a, a few times, of course. Obviously, I think that Flashback does the same sort of thing a lot better and blows both of those games out of the water. They're just so much better looking, but I'm also guessing that didn't come out in 1992, so I don't even know I'm talking about it. Uh, Super Star Wars is fine. Uh, it's, a, it's a good game, don't get me wrong. I think the, the 3D sections are with the Mode 7. I think that's all pretty impressive. Obviously, Street Fighter 2 is a great-looking game. I think, okay, this is going to be a controversial choice, uh, but I think I'm going to go with NCAA Basketball, and I'll tell you why. I know that Turtles in Time looks exactly like the arcade game, and that's definitely impressive, and the Sonic the Hedgehog 2 is super speedy, but I had never seen anything like NCAA Basketball before. In fact, it's criminal that nobody talks about NCAA basketball anymore, and I understand why they don't. These days, every basketball game is a 3D basketball game, so it's not all that impressive, but man, back then, this thing could not have been cooler looking. It's a little archaic now, but I'm shocked that people don't still talk about it for how innovative it was, especially graphically. Like, all these other games, for the most part, were just better looking versions of what had come before, but NCAA Basketball, it, boy, it delivered in a way that I had never seen before. Something that really stood out, and, and that's coming from a guy who doesn't care much about basketball. I think I'm going to be the only one here, but I gotta go with it. NCAA Basketball for Best Graphical Achievement. I guess that brings us to Best Sound Achievement, and... Oh boy, oh man, um, here are the nominations. Hook on the Super Nintendo. It Came From the Desert on the TurboGrafx CD. Loom on the Turbo Duo. Mick and Max Global Gladiators on the Genesis. MLBPA Sports Talk Baseball on the Genesis. Prince of Persia on the Super Nintendo. Super Star Wars on the Super Nintendo. Tasmania on the Genesis. The Addams Family on the TurboGrafx CD, and World Heroes on the Neo Geo. Oh boy. Okay. How are we going to do this? We've talked about some of these in various Game Over episodes. If you saw what we did with the Addams Family a few months ago, then you'll remember that it has, it has some voice acting, and it's okay. The voice acting, and it came from the desert, is, is also... Okay, I'm not sure either of those necessarily deserves to win, but let's go through the rest of these. We'll figure this out. I don't think Hook deserves to be there. The music's fine, but 
it's Hook. I like Mick and Max Global Gladiators, but I, uh, I'm not sure the music's the best part of that game. I would say the Sega CD has the best music of the Prince of Persia games, but I'm guessing that probably came out in 1993. Hey, Super Star Wars is here because it does that song everybody knows from Star Wars pretty well. I'm not a huge Star Wars fan, sorry. It would not make my list. I don't think it's one of the better ones. Though it does, I mean, to be fair, it does sound good. Hmm. Now, the one that was probably the most innovative at the time was Sports Talk Baseball on the Genesis. I mean, it was so innovative that they put the gimmicky part in the title, and it's kind of the whole selling point, which is that it, it has digitized voices giving you, like, a full commentary. Now, if you're younger, then you're probably scratching your head thinking, wasn't that in every sports game? And the answer is no. We're pretty spoiled these days with commentaries in sports games because that is not a thing that I grew up with. But was the commentary good? No, it was very first generation. They didn't have a whole lot of room on the cartridge to work with. And it's really hard to listen to these days. I dare anybody to go back, play that game with the sound on. It's just annoying. Oh boy, looking over this list, I'm just not sure. I mean, I... I like the music and world heroes, but oh, I can't, I can't do that. All right, I'll tell you what. Only one of these games emphasizes the music and sound design, and that's Loom. I'm not here to say that it has the best music of 1992 or anything like that, but it is the one where music is kind of the whole point. So knowing that I can't in good conscience give it to It Came From The Desert or Sports Talk or Prince of Persia, I gotta go with Loom. So Loom is my vote for best sound achievement in a game, I guess. I think this is going to be one a lot of people disagree with me on. I think people will probably go with Super Star Wars. That, that you know, everyone loves that. Everyone loves that John Williams score. Even if it's that kind of weird Super Nintendo 16-bit audio version of it. That's just, that's just my guess. All right, we're to the final three categories. We're, we're finally to the part where we're going to talk about the best games of the year. Get ready, because we're going to look at the best 8-bit game of the year, the best handheld game of the year, and then the best 16-bit game of the year. But before we get to the 16-bit stuff, let's, of course, look at the old stuff, the stuff that was starting to be a little bit outdated. Not, not a little bit, a lot outdated by this point. All the 16-bit systems were out, so people were not all that excited to go back and play 8-bit games. And I think when I read off this list, you're going to see that. The nominations for Best 8-Bit Game of the Year are... Batman Returns on the NES. Darkwing Duck on the NES. Felix the Cat on the NES. The Flintstones on the NES. King's Quest V on the NES. Mega Man 5 on the NES. Nightshade on the NES. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 3 The Manhattan Project on the NES. The Empire Strikes Back on the NES. And Tom and Jerry on the NES. Oh boy. Um... This was not a great year for 8-bit games. I think that most of the developers had already moved over, obviously, to the Genesis and Super Nintendo. Some of them were even looking forward to the new stuff after that. So, this was not a great year for 8-bit games. And if you were still holding on to your Nintendo Entertainment System instead of upgrading to the Super Nintendo or Genesis, then... I mean, you had a couple of good games, I suppose. There's not... I mean, these aren't terrible, but... Oh. Boy, there are a couple I would immediately, immediately get rid of. Let's axe the Flintstones. Let's get rid of Batman Returns. That Empire Strikes Back game on the NES was not good. Also, King's Quest V on the NES. We gotta get rid of that. How did how did that make it on, but not Dragon Warrior 4? That's what I wanna figure out. Hmm, so what does that leave us with? We got, uh... We got Darkwing Duck, the... Felix the Cat. Get rid of it. Uh, what does that leave us with? We got uh, Darkwing Duck, um, Mega Man 5, Nightshade. That's a that's an odd little game, isn't it? Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 3, The Manhattan Project. I like that Mutant Turtles game, I do. 
of the three Turtles games on the Nintendo, I would say that's the best one. But that's not the question, because the real thing we want to find out is, is it better than Mega Man 5 or Darkwing Duck? Darkwing Duck is kind of a Mega Man clone. I mean, it's it's not exactly the same, obviously, but it is compared to, like, DuckTales and Chippendale Rescue Rangers. But on the other hand, Mega Man 5, that's one of the lesser 8-bit Mega Man games by quite a wide margin. That's not one of my favorites. Hmm. Darkwing Duck is something I actually played not that long ago. Uh, we did a whole a a Game Over episode about it recently, which you should go and watch. And I had, I, had a, I had a fun time. And I think I'd rather go back and play that than go back and play Mega Man 5. So I'm... Ooh, this is not a great list. But for best 8-bit game of the year... Oh, no, I can't... I can't... I can't do that. I can't do that. Oh, this is just a no win no matter what. Oh, what am I going to do? You know what? I'm going to call an audible. And I'm going to go with Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 3 The Manhattan Project. I think it was probably overshadowed by Turtles in Time on the Super Nintendo, but it's still a pretty good game. And it's of these, it's the one I kind of want to go back and play right now. So yeah, Mutant Turtles 3 Manhattan Project is my choice for 8-bit game of the year. Oh, that was not an easy choice. All right, hopefully this will be easier. Handheld Game of the Year. The nominations are Axe Battler on the Game Gear, Batman Returns on the Lynx, Bionic Commando on the Game Boy, Looney Tunes on the Game Boy, Mega Man 2 on the Game Boy, Metroid 2 on the Game Boy, Sonic the Hedgehog 2 on the Game Gear, Star Wars on the Game Boy, Super Mario Land 2 on the Game Boy, and finally, Tiny Toon Adventures on the Game Boy. Okay, so I like that there's more representation of consoles on the handheld game list than there, there were on the 8-bit, and, and that's just obviously because the Master System had pretty much died by 1992. Unfortunately, I'm not a huge fan of some of the games on both the Game Gear and the Lynx. The Batman Returns game, for example, on the Lynx is... Awful. I mean, the graphics are pretty good, but it is so difficult and so hard to play. I also didn't like Axe Battler that much. We've already talked about that a little bit. Bionic Commando on the Game Boy is pretty great. Uh, the Looney Tunes Game Boy game is fine. <sighs> Mega Man 2 is fine. I mean, it's it's really good. I, in fact, I, I loved it at the time. I would still strongly recommend it. It looks great. Um, it, it, it is a perfect representation of Mega Man in black and white, but it's also just kind of a port of levels that we saw in the old NES games. I can't vote for something that's basically just a port of what we had seen before. And that's also kind of the problem I'm having with Bionic Commando, even though it is, again, a really solid version of that game. Not that into Star Wars on the Game Boy, and I could take or leave Tiny Toon Adventures also on the Game Boy. Metroid 2, I know that has a, a lot of fans. There are a lot of people that love that game. It's fine. Oh, boy. You know what? Of these, if you were to ask me, which of these do I want to go back and play right this minute, even though it's flawed, I think, of course, I, I would have to go with Super Mario Land 2. So while it's not as good looking as Batman Returns on the Lynx, and there's probably more innovative games here, I... My vote for best handheld game of the year, pro it has to go to Super Mario Land 2. It's just a really solid 2D platformer, and there's a huge upgrade from Super Mario Land 1. And here we are, we have finally come to the best 16-bit game of the year. And this, look, by, for all intents and purposes, this is the best game of the year category. We've seen a few of these games already pop up in other categories, but let's just go through them anyway. We have Alien 3 on the Genesis, Contra 3, the Alien Wars on the Super Nintendo, Mech and Max Global Gladiators on the Genesis, out of This World on the Super Nintendo and Genesis, Roadrunner's Death Valley Rally on the Super Nintendo, Sonic the Hedgehog 2 on the Genesis, Spider-Man and the X-Men Arcade's Revenge on the Super Nintendo, 
Street Fighter 2 on the Super Nintendo, Super Double Dragon on the Super Nintendo, Super Star Wars on the Super Nintendo, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 4 Turtles in Time on the Super Nintendo, and finally, The Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past on the Super Nintendo. Well then, there are a lot of there are a lot of pretty good games here. In fact, there are some genuine classics on this list that I would recommend to anybody. Spider-Man and the X-Men Arcade's Revenge is not one of them, so that really needs to go. I hate to say it, but I would also get rid of Super Double Dragon. I mean, it's fine, but is it one of the best 16-bit games of 1992? No. Ugh, Super Star Wars is fine. I know, I know people love that game. It's, it's fine. I'm also going to get rid of Roadrunner's Death Valley Rally. It looks great. It plays great. I like it, but it doesn't belong on this list. I think the rest actually is pretty solid, though. Like, it's... It's really tough to compare Contra 3 and The Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past. They're just two completely different types of games, and they're both great doing completely opposite things. <sighs> Alien 3 is pretty great too, though, and and more people should go back and play that, because it's, it's one of the few movie games that really, really got it. When it comes down to it, though, I think this is a choice between Street Fighter 2 and The Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past. And when I think about it, I have to think, well, do I want to go back and play the Super Nintendo version of Street Fighter 2 when I could play any of the other versions? And you know what? Maybe that's not fair. In 1992, there weren't different versions of Street Fighter 2. I mean, there was the arcade version, but at home, this is what you got. And it's really, really great. Like, it's it is such, such a good port. But is it better than A Link to the Past? Especially, especially now that, in hindsight, now that there are so many other versions of Street Fighter 2 that I can go back and play that are arcade perfect. <sighs> I know that's not fair, and I'm not even sure how to, I'm not even sure how to break this tie. This would have been the easiest decision in the world back in 1992, because I, I would have said Street Fighter 2 10 out of 10 times. A Link to the Past is one of those Zelda games that I think is, it's probably my favorite of the Zelda games. Street Fighter or Zelda? Street Fighter or Zelda? I might regret this later, but I think I'm gonna go with Street Fighter 2. But look, it's not by much. Like, it's it's really not by much. They're both so damn good. Ah. Oh. Yeah. My vote for the 16-bit Game of the Year goes to Street Fighter 2 on the Super Nintendo. Is not the best Street Fighter 2 game you can play now. There are tons of better ones, and I get it. But in 1992, you couldn't do any better. And when it comes down to it, I'm voting on 1992. And I think if I'm just being honest with myself, it's hard to say that Street Fighter 2 was not the best game of the year. It definitely left the biggest impact, and it's something we're still feeling. Zelda 3 is a great sequel, and it's my favorite of the Zelda games, but I don't know if it beats Street Fighter 2 in 1992. And there you have it, my picks for the best games of 1992. This was a pretty good year for games, anchored by the rise of fighting games and a ton of licenses. In fact, I'm honestly a little shocked by how many licensed games are on this list. I remember there being a lot, but GamePro really went all in on the movies and cartoon games. Perhaps that says something about the audience, but I don't know. Either way, here's my filled out ballot ready to be sent to that P.O. box. Too bad nobody's there to get it. I guess I probably shouldn't have waited this long to fill it out. Oh well. Hey, thanks for watching our review. If you liked what you saw here, then you should know that we post new reviews and features almost every day. Now here's the question I have for you. What are your favorite games of 1992? I'm curious to see how you would have filled out this ballot and if you agree with all of my reasoning. Let me see your thoughts in the comments below. In other news, we'll be back next week with a whole bunch of reviews, followed by a show about cheat codes. If that sounds good to you, then I strongly recommend you click that subscribe button and support what we're doing here. Until then.